So just for a few minutes in this presentation I want to talk about the ways in which we measure the variability in a set of data and the kind of statistics we use to um, indicate that and what use we can make of them. So if we have a set of data, we've collected um, something like a set of measurements of height or IQ or enzyme activity or something like that, whatever it happens to be, we will find inherent within that is quite a marked variability. The data are not all the same, they are distributed. And we can plot those data and the way we do that is typically to look at the range of amplitudes of our different uh, individual data points and then divide up that range into a number of bins or a number of classes and see how many of our observations fall into each one. So in this case I've got a range of amplitude bins and I've plotted the frequency that is the number of individuals in each of those amplitude bins and then along the bottom along the x-axis of my graph I've put the bins in order and up the side I've put the frequency the number in each bin and you get this distribution and a lot of biological data form this kind of distribution it's called a normal distribution and it has these characteristics it's basically bell shaped the mean value sits right in the middle of the bell and so does the modal value um, so it's symmetrical. Now if we know that our data is normally distributed with this symmetrical bell shape and we know what the mean value is, it tells us quite a lot about how our distribution sits, what it's like. But nevertheless we do need to know a little bit more. So for instance we can have two sets of data that are both normally distributed, that both have the same mean and mode, but they are not the same in the way that the data are spread. So here I've still got the overall shape shown by the blue line of my normally dis distributed data set we looked at in the previous slide. But if I add another one in there, the green line outlines another distribution which also sits with its mean and mode in the same position as the blue one does. Um, and it's symmetrical bell shaped but clearly it's not as spread out as the blue one. And that means it's got a, a lower dispersion. The data are more clustered around the mean, different shape. Now we need to have some way of describing that and so we calculate another variable. We characterize it using a statistic that takes account of the extent to which each individual in the population is separated from the mean, the dispersion of it. For each individual value how far away is it from the mean? And the way we calculate that is shown in that uh, formula at the bottom there and you don't need to know that in detail but a point worth noting is this term here. Mu is the mean, that's the Greek letter mu on the right there, and each of those values xi is going to be is representing each of our individual values. So that term xi minus mu is saying how far is each point away from the mean. And we calculate a, a, a statistic taking account of all of these, and that's called the standard deviation. And you can calculate the standard deviation very easily in Excel. It's using uh, the term equals STDEV and the A to B inside the brackets just uh, describes the array of cells containing the data in your distribution. Standard deviation is really, really useful. Once you know the mean and the standard deviation of a normal distribution, you know everything about its shape. So this graph at the bottom of this slide again shows the standard normal distribution where along the bottom, along the x-axis, we've got all our amplitude bins arranged starting from the smallest ones at the left to the biggest ones on the right and then we've plotted the number of individuals in each one on the y-axis, the vertical axis and when you put a line through that shape you get this uh, bell shape. And once we know the standard deviation we know roughly to quite a good degree of accuracy where our values will lie. So on that graph the blue line up the middle is the mean and it's also the mode and then the red box and the red arrow is saying that plus or minus one standard deviation so that's from the mean moving to the right by one standard deviation and the mean moving to the left standard one standard deviation if we take the part of our distribution between those two lines that includes roughly 68 percent of all our values and it always will whatever the um, normal distribution we're looking at if we take that further and we say how many of our values fall within two distributions above the mean and two distributions below the mean, 
that's going to be about 95% of our distribution. And if we say three standard deviations above and three standard deviations below, that's just about the whole distribution. And that's absolutely characteristic. And that allows us to use mean and standard devi deviation to say things about distributions, to compare distributions with each other, to say whether an individual value we've just measured is likely to belong to the same population as our distribution or not. So it's a very, very useful statistic. Now, normally, when we're dealing with means and standard deviations, we're dealing with samples. For most things, we can't possibly know the characteristics of an entire population. So what we do is we take a sample to give us an idea about what's going on. And if a population uh, that we're looking at is normally distributed or close to it, then if we take the mean of a sample and we calculate the standard deviation of a sample, it provides us with an estimate of the characteristics of the population. And then we can use that information to say things about how the population is shaped and whether individuals belong to it, as I was just explaining. But the question we've got to deal with is, when we take a sample, how accurate is our sample mean as an estimate of the population mean? Is it really telling us the truth, or can it be quite some way off? And if you, for instance, take two samples, and they are different in terms of their means, do we trust that they are really different and from different populations, or is it just that it's random sampling within our big population? And to assess this problem, to, to understand where we stand in this, we've got to take account of the sample size. And the reason for that is that the bigger the sample size, the more accurate we estimate the characteristics of the population that we're sampling. And that's shown here. And what I did here was to get Excel to generate a population of values for me. And that population of values had a total n of 500, so I had a sample of 500, or if you like, in this case, I had a, a complete population of 500 points. They are normally distributed. Population size, it says it's 500. The mean of that population was 157, and the standard deviation of that population is just under 50. And if I take all those 500 points and I divide them up into uh, amplitude bins, and I've used a bin interval of 10, which means I've gone 0 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, etc., all the way up to, in this case, 350. Get the frequency in each bin and plot it, I get this, which, as you can see, is a nice bell-shaped curve, and our mean sits up the middle here. It's a normal distribution, and this is our, our complete population. What I then did was to sample that population. And initially, I took samples of just three, so I took three values, and I repeated that again and again and again, and I did it 500 times. So I've got 500 samples, and each sample is a size 3. And you can see that now I've again got a normal distribution, but it's rather tighter than the original one. But bear in mind, these are means of samples. So I can have sample means giving me values right up to 250, just about, or right down to about 75 or 80. And these are estimating the mean of a sample which has got a real uh, mean of 157. Nevertheless, they're not going right out to the edges. They're giving me something useful. What happens if I increase the sample size up to 10? And you can see that now it's much better. Now, most of my samples are falling close to the real mean. There's nothing that's bigger than 200 and nothing that's smaller than 100. So they're all within about 50 of the real mean. And if I increase the sample size yet more to 20, it's slightly better than that. So the bigger my sample sizes get, the better they estimate the real mean. There's no great surprise in that, but we have to take account of it. So the accuracy of our sample mean depends on the sample size, n. And as you could see in the previous slide, if we take a lot of samples and plot those in the same way that we plotted our original data, we again get a distribution. And again, it's normal, like the raw data, but it's tighter, and the bigger the size of n, the tighter it is, the more accurate it is. So to assess the accuracy of a sample mean of size n, what we do is we use that distribution of sample means. And we can describe that distribution in just the same way we can describe our distribution of ordinary values, and we describe that by a statistic called the standard error. And the standard error is usually written s dot e dot m, and that means standard error of the mean. And we calculate the standard error because it's related to the standard deviation of the population. 
and it takes account of the variability of the population, the standard deviation, and the size of the sample we take out of it, n. And so SEM, standard error of the mean, equals the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size that we're using. And we can therefore easily do that again in Excel, where we basically have STDEV of our set of data, STDEV A to B, A to B being our set of cells we're using, and then we just divide that by the square root of the number of cells we're using. So it's standard deviation divided by SQRT, square root of the count of cells A to B, how many of them are, are there. And the details of that are given in the yellow box. So we've got two kinds of measurements we can get out. We've got the standard deviation, which gives us information about the normal distribution of all the data. And we've got the standard error of the mean, which gives us information about the distribution of means of size n. And therefore, the bigger the n is, the smaller the standard error gets. And that's what it says in those first two bullet points. So which one we use depends on what we're trying to do. If we want to describe our individual distribution or our distribution of individual data and what it looks like, we use standard deviation. If we're thinking about a sample we've taken and we want to make some kind of statement about how accurate that sample mean is as a reflection of the population mean, we use standard error. And also again, when we're comparing sample means, we've got two samples with different means and we want to know whether they're really different or not, then we use a version of the standard error. And that's slightly more complicated, but not too difficult to do. And again, Excel will do it for you. Finally, putting error bars on graphs. How do you do that? What I've done is shown, or uh, this slide will show you error bars using either standard deviation or standard error. So what's plotted here is something that's happening over a period of time. We've got a maximum response that's occurring at around about 35 to 40 minutes, starting off with almost nothing. Maybe we're watching a chemical reaction or something. And we've done this a number of times and plotted the mean value we get at each time point. If we plot standard deviation, we get this. So this is showing at each time point one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. And what it's telling us is how far spread out are our individual points. Clearly our individual points can vary quite a lot. When we're looking at about 25 minutes they can be anything below between sort of 4, 35, 40 percent going up to 80, 90 percent according to that error bar and that's just plus or minus one standard deviation. So the whole population is going to spread significantly more than that. But if we're asking the question is that mean we plotted a useful estimate of the real mean of all the experiments we could ever do then we might want to put on standard error. And if we put on standard error, it looks like that. And that's because we've used a big sample, in this case the sample is 20, and therefore standard error of the mean is a lot smaller than standard deviation. And we can safely say that our error is quite a good estimate, giving us a quite a good estimate of the real mean. So for instance, at 25 minutes, we've got a value of 60% as our mean, and probably somewhere between 45 and 75 is going to be about real and means not going to fall outside of that area. So when you're using statistics to describe a sample you've got and you think it's normal, you've got two measurements of error you can use and you need to make an intelligent decision about which one you want and when you interpret it and when you talk about it in the accompanying text you need to take account of that.